We know that Jesus was cared for by earthly parents, Joseph and Mary. Did you know that he had four brothers? James, Joseph or Joseph, Judas and Simon. Now, these are different from his apostles. Jesus had four brothers. And by the way, Alex and those who have sisters, Jesus also had sisters. Sisters are good. Jesus also had sisters. You can read all that in Mark 6, 3. James was probably the eldest among the, the brothers. Nothing much is mentioned about Jesus' back except that they didn't believe in Jesus and even thought that he was out of his mind. You can read that kind of account in Mark 3.21 or John 7.5. They didn't believe him. For James, he couldn't believe that the brother he had played with, at with, lived with, was human and was not. And you wonder if Mary even told her kids about the day angel Gabriel appeared to her. But all this would change for James, the half-brother of Jesus, only after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And Paul records it specifically because he does record that Jesus appears to James, then to all the apostles in 1 Corinthians. And from then on, James not only became a follower of Jesus, he became a prominent leader of the church in Jerusalem. And Paul would write about meeting him in Jerusalem, Galatians 1.19. And Peter would give instructions after he was he escaped prison to give instructions to inform James and the others about his escape, Acts 12, 17. Most of all, he would feature very prominently in the famous Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 as being the deciding authority in the conflict between Paul Barnabas and the Jerusalem church leaders. It was quite a bit of an issue on the issue of circumcision of new believers. Even Paul would call James as one of the pillars of the church alongside with Peter and John. So as James, the brother of Jesus, who was an eyewitness, not only for his ministry, but he was an eyewitness really to Jesus' whole life. He rose to become a fervent follower of Jesus to the point of even identifying himself as a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James was martyred around AD 62. So welcome to the epistle of James. Some say that James is about the earliest writing of the New Testament. As with any biblical book, it is important to understand the context surrounding its writings. We cannot take a book up and read it and just assume that we understand the surrounding and apply everything accordingly. We have gone through this extensive study on the writings of Paul, and we touched on the writings of Peter last few episodes. Understanding not only the historical settings of the time, but also the concerns and the motivation of the authors will help us to understand the messages better. It will help us apply them even more effectively and correctly to our lives, to our teaching, to our doctrinal studies today. James 1.1, 1, 1, very simple statement, very similar to Paul. James, a servant, Zulos of God and of Lord Jesus Christ, Yesu Christu, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greek things. Version, the Greek version has Yaakov, but basically it's James. Five different men in the New Testament are called James, including two of Jesus' 12 disciples were named James. But only two of these five men would have if we actually analyze their status, would have had enough authority in the early church to write a letter like this. Only two possible candidates. The first one is James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. But according to Acts 12 too, this poor James was martyred under Herod Agrippa around 44 AD, so too early, because this letter would have been written a little bit later. So most theologians, they come to the conclusion that the authorship is with James, the half-brother of Jesus. So it's interesting why, when you read the James 1.1, 1, 1, why he didn't identify himself as James, brother of Jesus. Rather, he identified himself as James, a servant of God, or in some of your versions, slave of Jesus. What a humble change in mindset. 
So they say that the Epistle of James is the most Jewish book in the New Testament. And we will find out why they say that it's the most Jewish book in the New Testament. Because it is often described as the antithesis to Paul. That means absolutely opposite to the theology that Paul subscribes to. But only if we do not understand the context and the audience of the letters, then will we agree that, that James and Paul are at opposite ends of the pole. So in this episode, you will not read of the gospel of redemption, like how Paul writes extensively. You will not even read of Jesus' birth, Jesus' death, resurrection. So understand that where Paul emphasizes roots, James is going to emphasize fruits. So get that mindset before we enter into the letter as well. Because comparing Paul and James might not be the best thing to do. The focus would not be how to become believers. It would be how to advance along the way of holiness. By the way, Paul wrote extensively about that too. A lot of times people just pick and choose what Paul writes. How do we tell the difference between fake Christianity and real Christianity? Nowadays, there are a lot of fake things. The litmus test could be written in the letter of James, and they call him James the Just. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes among the nations, greetings. Or some of your versions say dispersion. Some of your versions may say diaspora. By the time you read Acts chapter 8, the church in Jerusalem would have been dispersed. The church in Jerusalem comprising of mainly Jewish Christians. They had dispersed and were forced to scatter due to great persecution. Read chapter 8. And who was the persecutor himself? Paul. Paul was a persecutor in chapter 8. But the more the persecution, the more the gospel was spread. So a lot of the Jewish Christians disperse out of Jerusalem. That's why they are called diaspora, disperse out of Jerusalem or Judea. They probably live in Samaria or somewhere in, a, in Syria side. Antioch, remember Antioch, the name Antioch. So these are the places that they've gone to. And James is writing to these guys, the Jewish Christians. And the apostles will eventually disperse as well, like Peter, like John, all they would all travel out to spread the gospel. Only James would stay on permanently to lead the church in Jerusalem. So it is believed that he wrote the letter prior to the meeting of the Jerusalem Council in AD 49. Why? Because he was writing specifically to Jewish Christians. So they believe that at that point in time, there were no Gentile Christians yet, or not that many. So he was specifically writing to a church that was fully Jewish, but Christian. So first thing he will write would be, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Joy in suffering, testing of faith produces endurance. How many of you have ever considered your suffering as joy? And you say hallelujah when you're broke. You say hallelujah when you're diagnosed of cancer. But here, James is saying, count it all joy. There is a song on this, count it all pure joy when you face trials. Whatever you are going through or whatever you have gone through, you will come out of it stronger in your faith. It, your endurance will grow. And he's echoing Paul's words, actually. Remember Paul in Philippians 4.4? 4, 4? Rejoice always in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Something wrong with these followers of Jesus Christ. They seem to be out of the world. And when Paul was writing this, rejoice always in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. He was in prison. Philippians was written in prison. Then he says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But actually this verse is talking about life experience, wisdom, that kind of wisdom. So he says, he will, God will not rebuke you if you just ask him for wisdom to grow your faith. Because if you ask, he will give you. But there is a condition. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the waves of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. So our lives are not tossed about by trials and suffering. Our lives are tossed about by our doubt and our disbelief. This is talking to Christians. And they worry and they fret and they get into stress. Our lives are tossed about because of our doubt and our disbelief in our Lord Jesus Christ. So in order not to be tossed around, we just need to be clear of what we believe. And we need to clear our doubts through prayer, through discussions, through study. Then our faith will be strong and we won't be tossed about. So let's focus on the right thing, not our trials and our suffering. Focus on our relationship. Focus on our growth in our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Echoing Jesus' words, Matthew 5, remember the Beatitudes. Remember what Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. So you will find in the letter of James, James echoes Jesus a lot. The content of James is actually quite directly parallel in many instances to the teachings and the sayings of Jesus. So then he talks about temptation. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Notice this, that James is very fast and furious. He goes from topic to topic, topic to topic. So you got to follow, follow him and follow me. Talks about faith, talks about endurance, he talks about temptation. Then he said, each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, desire when he has conceived gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. See, nobody crosses the path to the other side just like that, the dark side. First, there's temptation. Then enticement. Then desire. Then sin. Then the path to no return. So how do we avoid sin after reading James' advice? Then it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because he talks about anger, because anger causes quarrels, anger causes fights, anger causes divorces, anger causes break of relationship, anger causes murder. Anger causes a lot of things. So he says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. This is talking about the word, Bible. But it says, don't listen and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Be doers of the word, not mere hearers of the word. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says. It's like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty and abides by it, not having becoming a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So James seems to be more concerned about the action. That's why I said earlier, he's not talking about how to be saved. He's talking about what we should do after we are saved. The fruits, not the roots. See, legalism is working for our salvation. And James is not really talking about that. How do we know of a fake Rolex to a real one? How do we know of a fake dollar to a real one? How do we know of a fake Christian from a real one? Read on. Those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight ring on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Fake religion. Okay, I think I didn't put that. Religion that God our Father accepts, this is in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, accepts as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So he, he believes that faith has to come with action. First of all is our attitude. Second of all is our attitude towards 
people who need help like orphans and widows. Then I like this one. Do not show partiality. This is talking about church. For if a man comes into your church, your assembly, with a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes. And you say, sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you can stand over there. You can sit down by my clothes too. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Let me ask you a question. I must hurry along. If one renowned cardiothoracic surgeon came to church today, how would you treat him? Seat him in the best seat? Give him a VIP seat? Fair enough. He's renowned. A minute later, Lionel Messi walks in. What would you do? Would you ask the thoracic surgeon to move aside for Lionel Messi? A few minutes later, Bill Gates walks in, the richest man in the world. What would you do with Lionel? Ask Lionel to move aside for Bill Gates to, to sit in that most VIP seat. What happens if Jesus walks in last? What would you do? So James is just talking about that in the church, everybody is equal. And if your brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of them says, depart in peace and be warm, I will pray for you, brother. Go in peace. But do not give them the things that are needed for the body. What does it profit? Does also faith by itself, if it doesn't work, does not have works, is dead. Fake Christianity. Strong words. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. Go back and read. I love the way he writes it. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. It's as practical as it can get. The pages of James are filled with direct commands to pursue a life of holiness. So when we approach James, we approach Paul, we must approach it differently. Holiness comes with understanding, faith, and wisdom and action. He makes no excuses for those who do not measure up. James is very firm. For James, a faith that does not produce real life causes is changes is a faith that is worthless. So faith must produce authentic deeds. In other words, if those who call themselves God's people truly belong to him, their lives will produce deeds or praise. The life of faith is comprehensive. It impacts every area of our lives. I know some, we, go, we grow through it. It may not happen immediately. And it drives us to truly engage in the lives of other people in the world. Is that your faith? 